So welcome to today's educational gathering. In this gathering, we discuss the topic of relevance to our everyday living. Um, uh, and I was sharing before we start talking on this on this note of getting recorded on the Hangout that I was hanging out with my radio this morning, and I was listening to a, a study of uh, uh, of uh, hospitals where they were talking to healthcare professionals and observing that as the amount of technolo technology in the hospitals increases, so does the various kinds of equipments. And all equipment comes in with some kind of a, a warning signs or a beep sound or something to alert a healthcare professional as to whether the IV is running out or the batteries are down or or something else more serious is happening that they need to be addressing. And that the more equipment that are being gathered in the hospital setting, there are more noises and more beeps and more kind of alerts. Uh, when we were in residencies and hospital things, the most common noise was uh, the overhead, uh, you know, somebody being paged uh, for, for whatever matter or somebody being called to a floor and so forth. And, and the most amount of noise was really in ICU settings or CCU settings because there were a lot more equipment. Uh, and in the usual floors, on the regular floor, you would have predominantly an IV running, and when it would run out, and then this was given a beep to come in and really kind of restart another IV or stop it and pull, pull the IV out. Those were the most common things. And since that time, it seemed that there are more and more equipments. Uh, and, and the point was being made was that um, the more equipment there is, the more warning signs there are, and that there is a, a fatigue on the part of the healthcare providers to be able to discern which is a serious noise because they have so much of noise and beeps coming their way, and they I could not tell the numbers. Uh, they were talking about how many beeps there are in a regular hospital due to our technology and, and and then the real dangerous things become get mixed and missed just the way if you are driving all day long and you get tired you're more likely to make errors we also know you know that pilot will land in a different airport um, uh, maybe at six or eight miles away there must be a factor <laughs> that he could not recognize that he was landing on a different airport. Um, that could have been a very costly thing. So when the healthcare providers are fatigued and tired, uh, they can cause they can cause costly mistakes. And so that was the issue at, at, at LA. And it reminded me of how important it is to, as healthcare providers, to be able to be in an optimal place of sleeping, being able to be attentive and being able to be able to care for the people who come in seeking their treatments. You know. I wonder if you have any experiences to share when you were tired as a student or, or fatigued as a student <laughs> and still had to do things. Um, I'm sure I've had a lot of experience with that. By the end of the day, sometimes you just need to go take a mental break before you can restart and actually absorb what you learned throughout the day. Yeah. Or yeah. you just don't remember any of it at all. We begin to phase out. Yes. Begin to phase mm -hmm. out. So, are you venturing to say that you're a human being and act like a person? I hope so. Yes. <laughs> okay. So you're not a machine. You're no. in the middle of all the other machines, mm -hmm. which can run for hours. We're not computers, which can keep running. You know, we as human beings become tired and fatigued, and our own needs and things are very similar. Do you have any experience? Yeah. I was just going to say, towards the second half of the day, in all of my rotations, I can sense myself sort of phasing out and have to stop yourself and, you know, at least pretend like you're enthusiastic because your mind is telling you you want to sleep and take a break. And so I've definitely been through that. I'm sure we all have. <laughs> so in other words, you know, your second half has started here too, right? I mean, it's like past yes. 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Do you need a bedroom? <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> <That'd> be nice. <laughs> the phase out time. <laughs> siesta, you know, in, in yeah. Spanish, they you know, siesta. You know, for three hours, they disappear. They're uh, sleeping. <laughs> Um, any any kind of experiences as a healthcare provider as a student that you can yeah share? especially as a student last year in you know our didactic phase you're in class all day sometimes you have a test in the morning for two three hours and then you have class the rest of the day and then 
you're supposed to go home and study for the next test, so you kind of just need to, you get a little bit exhausted, you need to give yourself a break. Absolutely. So we are we're aware of our the times when our mind begins to not be able to capture information mm -hmm. in a meaningful manner mm -hmm. and be as effective. Mm -hmm. uh, anything, James, you can think of? Well, at times, <clears throat> some people slip in from being a human being to being a human doing, mm -hmm. where we just go along with the flow and really aren't a participant. We're just just there, doing, not being. Absolutely. And being aware of our own you know, kind of state of affairs. Yeah. Anything, Steve, that you can... I was thinking about being a human doing instead of human being at the end of a 12-hour shift in the emergency department overnight around 7 o'clock in the morning. That's when I feel like I'm just doing and I would have appreciated a room, too. <laughs> <laughs> a call room for yes. myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to share a bit about, you know, where you're leading in your life and why you even came for this rotation? Uh, the reason I came for this rotation was because I'm hoping to do child and adolescent psychiatry, specifically focused on autism spectrum disorders, but um, I'm a little more conservative when it comes to just uh, doing medicine, so I wanted to look at the whole whole picture, the whole person. So when I was looking up you know, rotations to do, I found this um, place and just how it offered not just medication, but various therapies, and specifically um, I've really enjoyed uh, nutritional aspects and yoga and things like that. So treating the whole person, it was um, interesting to me. Yeah. And have you noticed anything within your own self that is different about you as a person by knowing and experiencing what we practice here? Absolutely. Uh, actually, last Tuesday, staying for, or previous Tuesday, staying uh, for DBT group, I uh, got a skill to take home and was it able to practice it immediately upon walking in the door I <laughs> um, technique and it and it worked uh, perfectly so I've been able to utilize it a few times since. what was that skill? it's called uh, give so basically I was receiving what she was saying uh, listening to it giving her giving value to her opinion and then expressing how I felt afterwards and uh, worked perfectly so okay and it with I love you and a kiss, so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we as clinicians, so part of this really kind of segment of our conversation was recognizing that whether it's a, uh, a, a soldier fighting a battle on the front front end of our country, a pilot flying a plane, a healthcare nurse delivering uh, a baby or a nurse, you know, giving an IV, they all are human beings. And they all share the common theme of needing that perspective of really allowing us to be in a good place. And then thus being in a good space to be able to make good decisions, not based on fatigue, tiredness, fear, and worries, and, 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 and just an instinctive brain, but more of a wise brain. And, and I think that we, as a, as a cultural norm, have gotten ourselves so pushed up, we are competing with machines anymore. You know? and, and we really cannot be mechanical. It just takes away the humanity of us. And so we want to regain just being human uh, and then being, a, being able to have an eight-hour sleep and an eight-hour of effective working, an eight-hour social life, and going to Connorsville and, <laughs> and riding a bike. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you say that? Right. In and good that's time. what I do every night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on that note, we'll kind of let go of this subject matter of uh, technology and fatigue. And Mike is giving me some idea to make a statement. I just, in this place anymore, just make the statements what I'm told to make. Um, <laughs> find out more at cclear.com. Follow us on Google Plus for these videos and to join us live Mondays at, the, at noon hours so you can ask questions for us to answer during our discussion. Uh, these are just our everyday uh, issues of life. Uh, which are not necessarily psychiatric disorders, but necessarily everyday living issues that we are addressing to be able to make them more uh, palatable for everyday consumption so that we, we can live in a healthful manner with our children, our families, our neighbors, and while in the car stuck in traffic. Thank you. <laughs>